Distinguished friends online, distinguished audience, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Qing Hai Yan from the CWA. Welcome to the second session of the Global Offshore Wind Summit. Because of uh, the epidemic, actually in the past, uh, we have this summit on a daily basis because of uh, the epidemic. We have to make this conference online. This is uh, already the second session. The first session is about uh, the technology innovation pathway of uh, the Global Offshore Wind. And at the same time, I'd like to uh, declare that um, with uh, the joint effort of the different organizers of uh, the Global Offshore Wind Summit and also in line with uh, the situation of the epidemic, the offline conference, the physical conference will be held on the 27th, 28th of August in Shandong without a major change of the epidemic. For example, if there's no major outbreak of the epidemic like it has in Beijing, uh, the conference will be held in on the 27th to 28th of August in Shandong because we know that Shandong province will be um, a land of hope for the future offshore wind development. You're more than welcome to participate and uh, we hope that you can give us more useful information and insights. The global uh, wind industry is getting more mature and the offshore wind has been taken by a lot of countries as a major way of the carbon emission reduction and energy transformation. At the same time, a lot of uh, traditional oil and uh, gas companies have making it uh, a major um, growth point and also the catcher for the future development. And also development of the offshore wind will generate a good social and economic benefit. And uh, the industrial chain of offshore wind is long. It not only drag, pull up the direct investment and also help the upgrading of industrial transformation of the region. high growth, um, more than 40% on annual growth rate uh, in the past 20 years. And uh, in by 2030, according to ARENA, the installed capacity of offshore wind will be accumulated to about 300 gigawatts with a great potential of development. Of course, technology innovation will be the source of power to promote the industrial development. And in recent 10 years, the offshore wind gradually developed from the near sea to the deep sea or far sea. The technology is making a lot of uh, progress. And uh, not long ago, the Mesa of uh, Siemens have uh, formally launched the 40 megawatt offshore wind turbines. It was estimated that those advanced technologies will become uh, more professional with higher uh, efficiency with the technology progress. The uh, construction uh, and uh, the uh, unit price of the offshore wind will be dropping down obviously and uh, uh, the there's a zero um, subsidy in Europe in the past last year. And uh, of course, these achievements are thinking to the efforts of those uh, practitioners in this sector. And today we have with us a lot of explorers of the offshore wind sector in the world. And originally from uh, Siemens, um, Mr. Herrick in 1991 led to build the first offshore wind farm, the wind by uh, offshore wind project of Denmark. It was very well known and uh, they used uh, 11 450 uh, kilowatt bonus wind turbines and um, the farm has ran for uh, 20 years with a good performance. And uh, in 2009, Herrick led the development of the first floating turbine high wind in the world. And uh, in the future, the development of the floating uh, Turbine will be a direction to explore the um, development of this sector. And uh, Henrik had more than 800 patents, a real inventor. And um, while he was working with the Siemens, uh, he was engaged into the patented um, blade manufacturing technology. And also now he is engaged into the new uh, floating uh, wind turbine uh, base development and uh, with uh, these kind of uh, uh, floating foundation development, uh, it, this issue has been transferred into the manufacturing um, issue and we, uh, he helped to greatly drop down the cost of this kind of technology to lay solid foundation for the future development in the far sea. So for the rest of the time, we have the honor to have Henrik with us today and from his own um, 
experience and research, he well shares the story about the innovation of uh, the global offshore wind technology. It is a rare opportunity, and also Harry was. Uh, is very busy, and we have the honor that um, despite the tight schedule, he participated into the summit to help us to talk about the offshore wind, including the techno floating technology. I'm convinced that Henrik's presentation today uh, will definitely help us to get a lot of inspirations, and that will help us to stimulate the passion for innovation and also to give us a lot of inspirations. And uh, after Henrik's presentation, we also invited those experts from uh, OSLED and uh, SPIC and the Shanghai Electric, etc. some uh, representatives from the manufacturers to talk about uh, the innovation of uh, offshore wind and how to innovate. And uh, also we have uh, Zhao Feng from uh, the GWE see uh, to moderate the session and this is a very valuable session and a lot of a very informative and uh, we hope that uh, the conference day will give you very informative uh, uh, knowledge a lot of interest uh, right from the yeah the very first uh, onshore wind farm which we delivered in 1989 um, for the first 25 years of development in Europe. You can see in 1991 that we had the very first wind farm at Windeby, as well as mentioned. In 95, Vestas put up the second project. And then we had this development. And you can see how it really, really speeded up after 2010. We now, as I sit here and speak, have about 22,000 megawatts in Europe. Um, and it's growing rapidly. So working in offshore wind is um, a really big contribution to the green transition that we need. Next, please. Next slide, please. Um, the technology development has been really dramatic in many ways. Uh, so what we have here is on the left, Windeby from 1991 with the 11 turbines we heard about earlier. Actually, I have a small correction. It was not uh, decommissioned after 20 years. The project actually ran for 26 years before it was decommissioned. These 450 kilowatt turbines would have an annual energy production of about 900 megawatt hours or 2,000 full load hours. And in comparison, a very recent project commissioned last year uses seven megawatt machines, so almost 20 times larger. And each machine produces 4,300 full load hours. So we have more than doubled the efficiency of the technology over those 25 years. Next, please. The next slide, please. And the cost development has really, really been dramatic. If you click a few times, you will see how the cost has come down in, in uh, Great Britain from a starting point in... A reduction in cost of 72% over five years. And the reason that has been doable is not just one thing, it's a combination of things. Uh, and if you click a few times, we can see we have five key parameters. So next, please, next slide, please, or next click. And here are the reasons it's about competition 
five key factors for the. Mm-hmm. 在全球呢，因为有很多的呢是浅水区，然后浅水区呢离人口密度比较大的城市比较近，另外在欧洲还有包括美国的西海岸，还有中国也都是一样的。但是呢，现在全球我们可以看到，大部分的水域并没有这么
with um, uh, new technologies uh, like blades or, or components or towers or foundations or electrical systems. The figures to keep in mind is 15 megawatts in 2025, 20 megawatts in 2030. So if you are a developer of a new floating foundation, like I am, you need to have your technology be suitable for uh, 15 megawatts, 250 meters in five years. <coughs> this So our purpose is to do something about climate change. Climate change is the biggest threat of all to all of us and to our children and our grandchildren. And our countries are members of the Paris Accord, where the world has agreed to keep the temperature rise be below 2 degrees and preferably below 1.5 degrees. But I just want to make clear that two degrees is not a safe place to be. At two degrees, all the coral reefs of the world will be gone. We can no longer go out swimming among corals. There's a very high risk that Greenland melting will happen no matter what we do then afterwards. And Greenland alone will give us a seven meter sea rise. Not within our lifetime, it's a matter of hundreds and hundreds of years, but it will completely change the world if we let that happen. So two degrees is not a safe place to be. Already now the weather is strange. And if we go much higher in temperature, there's no knowing where we will be. So this is what drives me. And I, I guess that it drives a lot of you that we need to do something about the climate. Next slide, please. And fortunately, when we work in offshore wind, we work um, with something that really matters. If you look at our potentials, on the left-hand side, we see uh, the front page of a re report done by the International Energy Agency. If you click once, please, Click one time, please. Next slide, please. Just one. Yeah, there we are. Then IEA concludes that we can do all of the electricity consumption in the world with a 50% adder on top with offshore wind. And if we introduce floating, we can do more than 10 times of the electricity load in the world. And on the right side is a, a world. So we need more and more electricity, not just electricity. We also need more and more electricity. And if we look at it in the bigger picture, we can see that the trajectory is going up. And if we look at it in the bigger picture, we can see that the trajectory is going up. The trajectory of the human development that we have in the world. This is a diagram that the UN is using to describe basically happiness. And what you can see is that there is a direct correlation between energy use and happiness. The more energy we use, the happier we are. It doesn't really work our right of the scale where you have countries that use a lot of energy and maybe don't have such a high quality of living. That tends to be oil producing countries that have just got used to having abundant energy. But other than that, the more energy we use, the better is the human development index. And we all want to be at a high human development index. So the opposite is also true. Yeah. <laughs> and what I wanted to show here in a sequence was that when we have low energy intensity, it tends to be um, based on, on simple energy. Then when countries get to be richer, they tend to have fossil fuels. And only for the richest countries 
offshore wind comes into the game. And what we need to change is that we should not have that in between. So if we go to developing countries, countries with, with um, um, emerging economies, what we should work to is to change this trajectory. Next slide, please. So what we should do is that we should have it so that our technology simply fundamentally replaces fossil fuel technologies. Nobody should install coal-fired power plants only to discover a few years later that they are too expensive and that we cannot afford it for the climate. That is, the, we work only in the upper right-hand corner. We work with electricity and heat production. But unfortunately, that is only 25% of the global emissions. So we also need to be able to affect agriculture, transportation and industry. They're the other big pieces of the... And in order to that, we need to expand our technology offering from just being electricity to being more. Next slide, please. Okay, maybe this doesn't work. So I think what I'll explain then, uh, yeah, uh, the, the key to it all is hydrogen. So when you think large scale offshore, you need to think hydrogen. Uh, we need to be able to produce cheap hydrogen from our, uh, um, from our offshore wind. Um, Next slide, please. Then let me go on to explain while we wait that with hydrogen, we can cover much more than just electricity. First of all, then can be used to, um, to make uh, electricity storage with, uh, so we go from electricity to store it and back to electricity. And that is not, um, um, it, it, it's not the most efficient way of storage, but it, it works for seasonal storage. But also is very important for the transportation challenge that we can see here. We can electrify parts of transportation, but there are other parts that cannot be electrified. Long distance. Of it we can do with non-carbon fuels, either with hydrogen directly or by converting the hydrogen into ammonia. Aircraft we cannot do with ammonia or hydrogen. There we need carbon fuels. And we'll just take a look at how we do that. Next, please. Next slide, please. Okay, so with ammonia, we can do transportation where we basically use the same engines as we do now. So you can actually run a truck or a ship on ammonia, just like you, you can run it on carbon fuels. But with aircraft, it's a different thing. We need carbon fuels because carbon fuels are the only ones that are light enough to be usable in, in aircraft. So for that reason, we need to look at smart ways to get carbon fuels. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, so I think that given that we have a debate coming up, next slide, please. Next slide, please. <coughs> So here I'm describing a cycle whereby we can do um, a smart way to convert plant waste into carbon fuels. The plants get all their carbon from the atmosphere. So all the wood we are surrounded with, I'm sitting here at a wooden table, all the carbon in the wood that is in my table comes from the atmosphere. And that also goes for straw and 
all other waste products from agriculture. By doing it, by, by treating that waste in a pyrolysis process, pyrolysis is basically just heating the waste material to a high temperature, five, 600 degrees centigrade without oxygen being present. Then we can get part of the carbon material out as, as a, a oil and gas that is suitable to make jet fuel. Or carbon that has become, carb, or plant material that has become carbonized. And there's the wonderful thing about carbonized plant material or biochar, that it does not rot. So you can just spread it on the fields, just like you would do with the fertilizer, but all the carbon remains locked for thousands of years. And that means that when we deliver back to the atmosphere, the CO2 from the jet fuel, we do not deliver back to the atmosphere as much as we took from it originally. Next slide, please. And as a result, we get a carbon negative process. The more jet fuel we produce, the more carbon we take out of the atmosphere. And that was our basic goal, as, as I said earlier. That's what we should power. Next slide, please. So to do that, we also, yeah, one back, please. To do that, we also need hydrogen from our offshore wind turbines. So by contributing with offshore wind in a combination with agriculture, we can actually turn agriculture from something that is a climate emitter to something that's a climate absorber. We can make a combination of carbon negative jet fuel and make climate friendly agriculture as long as we get some hydrogen from offshore wind. Next slide, please. And in that way, we can transform a very complicated energy system. And this is the Danish energy system in 2017 with a lot of input of fossil fuels and other kinds. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. We can change that to a much simpler energy system. Again, I use Denmark as an example, where we base it purely on offshore wind and a bit of solar and some biomass from agriculture. And the black arrow at the bottom of the slide is our carbon negative uh, flow of, of, of the big transfer. We speak about turning countries like China or Denmark and also developing countries, turning them into other types of countries by transforming the energy sector. That's what we can do in offshore wind. Here's a picture from from uh, New York that shows a similar transition that happened before. Um, this is a picture that was taken on Easter day, that was in April um, in the year 1900. And we can do the little game of saying, where is the car? There's a car in the picture, spot the car. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, go one back, please. Go one back, please. There's the car. In this picture, there's one car. And this is a picture 13 years later, and we can play the same game and say, spot the horse. There's one horse in the picture. Next, please. That is, and this transformation came. And if somebody had said in the year 1900, ah, yeah, yeah, that's fine. We cannot just change our uh, way of living in New York from something based on horses, that will not happen. And we know now that it happened. And that's the same we can do with our energy system. Next slide, please. So here's a little about where we are going. By 2030, we'll be around 20 megawatts with 275 meter rotors. 
but we must do much more than just electricity. We must also have a strong impact transportation with so-called power to X, in other words, fuels based on hydrogen. We must also have a strong industry and industry with hydrogen. And there, the most important thing is to make steel production with hydrogen as a chemical agent for deoxidizing the iron. And we must also uh, um, solve the agricultural challenge, and we can do that with sky clean and get carbon negative jet fuel in the same process. Next, please. So, in my opinion, offshore wind can become the dominant dominant source of electricity, together with solar PV and, of course, also onshore wind. Next, please. And you can always ask, of course, can we make this happen? But my, here my statement is very simple. Next slide, please. That of course we can make it happen because we have the hand. So that's the end of that. Thanks for your attention. Uh, thanks for the, for the um, spending the time. I think the main message here is that we work in the best field of activity in the world because we can actually help solve the world's biggest problem. So what more can you ask for? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Henrik. Can you hear me well? I hear you well. Yeah. Uh, first of all, apology for this uh, IT issue. We, we simply got some you know, bad connection uh, with Beijing. So there is a delay. Um, so um, I think even though we have this uh, IT challenge, but in general, uh, this and, and the explanation to the audience um, from different parts of the world who joined this webcast this morning, I think the message is clear and it's crucial. Uh, the big roles for offshore wind industry to play and you bring, you know, actually bring us, uh, the speaker, panelists, and audience actually to the next level in terms of how we are going to transform the entire energy system. Um, so right now, I think the industry is fighting for the pressure in terms of cost reduction and how to get the supply chain built up. Uh, OEM introduced the larger turbine one after another. Um, we, got, we do have the short-term uh, challenge here and the pressure, but long-term wise, I think you give us this uh, visionary uh, outlook. It's really, really fa fantastic. I think together with solar can play, uh, this cross-industry cooperation, that's absolutely uh, needs us to think about moving forward. Uh, it's simple. Uh, we did that in our GWAP annual report, uh, you may be aware. You know, we cannot count simply on renewables when solar alone to come, to achieve this uh, global energy transition. Mm. It's time to think about going bigger because we are no longer a niche industry. We are getting bigger, stronger, much more reliable. So we become, when has become one of the main, you know, mainstream energy source. So it's really time to think about working cross industry, uh, this uh, cooperation, like the hydrogen you mentioned is the power to X. That's absolutely the, a way forward. Uh, I'm so glad to see, you know, your company stay still as now it's working on different direction. Floating, that's one thing. Uh, after in, went far in Denmark, and then now you are working on floating, also storage, uh, another big pillow uh, mm. under your um, technology company. That's the Sky, uh, Sky Team. Uh, in, in one of your slides, uh, I remember clearly, yeah, uh, this Sky Clean cycle, that's mm. absolutely, uh, you know, far way out thinking. That's really, really uh, crucial. I think um, short term, challenge that's one thing we need to look at the long term in terms of get the temperature under control following the paris agreement uh, in general to help the uh, energy transition 
once again, uh, apology for all this uh, techno uh, technology uh, challenge. And uh, I know it's uh, frustrating. You have to mm -hmm. stop and start again. Um, but uh, that's uh, probably that's something we learned during the pandemic. Uh, we do have web took place in the past. Sometimes it works well. Sometimes like this, we have a little challenge. Uh, I hope that you, you know, uh, accept uh, our apology and yeah, yeah, no problem. We can to make the uh, smooth. Now I'm going to uh, took over um, from you, uh, Henry. Yes. Um, so right now uh, we are going to have. Uh, one hour panel discussion based on you know the offshore and offshore related technology uh, you presented um, to the audience today um, join me uh, for this panel uh, apart from you Henry, uh, direct, uh, directly join the event from Owens uh, in Denmark uh, we also have the uh, director for uh, offshore wind RMD at Oster in Denmark, um, Christina Abel. Uh, Christina has a long standing track record in the wind industry, working for different turbine OEMs, including uh, Vistas before uh, uh, she joined um, Oster. Um, last year, I, I, I attended the Copenhagen offshore uh, event where Henrik, you chair one C2 panel. Uh, I can recall Christina, uh, she is one of the uh, panelists as well. Um, so I made a lot of love. Uh, I think um, the point she made is uh, really uh, raised up the attention for the audience. Um, apart from Christina, we have uh, um, one speaker from Shanghai Electric, uh, Mr. Kang Pangju. Uh, he's uh, the uh, digital officer and also the head of uh, technology at the Shanghai Electric uh, Wind Power. As we all know, the wind business at Shanghai Electric has just run independent. The, launch, uh, the IPO application has just been uh, approved by the Chinese authority. So um, also on this call, we have uh, Mr. Zhang Wenge. Uh, uh, SPIC, uh, uh, SPIC is one of the Chinese top five utility, but he's the, uh, the assistant to the general manager at the um, construction unit of SPIC. Uh, he is also uh, a manager for one of the subsidiary uh, company under SPIC. Uh, the last speaker, but not at least, uh, it's uh, Mr. Dong Chen, uh, she is from one of the Chinese uh, utility, and uh, she is based in Yangjiang. Um, I think um, most of the audience can recall, uh, we do have uh, the previous offshore summit um, took place uh, in Yangjiang. Uh, we have Henrik there as well, um, joined the event as a killer. Uh, Mr. Dong. Uh, Mr. Dong Chen, uh, she is a deputy general manager uh, at the CECEP uh, Yangjiang. Um, she has a long experience in the wind sector as well. She started uh, working with wind from the beginning of 2000, so almost 20 years of experience now sitting in Yangjiang working for uh, taking care of the uh, project construction work uh, in Guangdong province. So, all right, that's, that's just the, yes, I can hear you. So, all right, right now we have uh, uh, all four speakers online. Um, so follow the presentation from uh, Henrik Stistel at the Pioneer uh, Industry. I think the picture he presented uh, earlier today, it's, it's so clear, uh, a big role for the industry to play and also in terms of energy transition and uh, this cross industry cooperation uh, is so crucial help the world to uh, get the temperature under control uh, in terms of climate change so for, for this panel discussion uh, we're going to continue the conversation and uh, we're going to uh, go through uh, 
four key questions. The first one that's regarding the next generation uh, 10 megawatt ultra turbine. And uh, we all know, uh, you know, the turbine name capacity size is getting bigger and larger. Follow the uh, a month ago, uh, SGRE just released the uh, 14 megawatt, uh, 220 diameter turbine. And before that, the larger turbine record is from G, uh, Noble, uh, Alia, uh, direct drive turbine. And uh, uh, looking at the, the global trend, you know that about the, the, the turbine of the size is getting bigger, larger, and uh, uh, the internal data from G is indicated. Uh, in China, uh, the average turbine size last year is 4.2 megawatt. Uh, in Europe, uh, actually, uh, megawatt higher. The average turbine size is 7.2 megawatt. Uh, so we can see the adoption of the larger. Because China, the Chinese offshore industry, uh, of uh, yeah, yeah, like one, yeah. you know one decade delay compared with uh, yeah. the uh, um so uh, now I have a question um for first i'm going to ask uh, christina um you know when ge released uh the 12 megawatt dd turbine halia x in 2018 follow the launch of the uh this turbine uh, Oster, um former Dawn Energy, uh, has already made the decision uh, to use the G Halia 12 megawatt turbine uh, in two U.S. projects. The first one, uh, Skip Job um, project, another project, one gigawatt in Ocean. That's the ocean one supposed to be uh, online on 2024. So here, uh, even though the developers, the one industry, keeps saying the stability, reliability, and sure, but especially one person developer like you know, uh, are keen to adopt. The next generation of the director for RMD, um, the offshore uh, at Oster. How, how do you see the trends of the uh, world? And in Europe, the average turbine size is 10.2. Now, the made the commitment to the public turbine. Earlier this week, uh, Enogy, now it's RWE, decided to use uh, SGRE 14 megawatt turbine to Sophia 1.4 ultra in UK. So it's it seems like that uh, you know the, the leading developer are really keen to use larger size turbines. How do you see the of, uh, you know the development of the next generation of the turbine? Do you believe that the utility are going to continue to take the next generation of turbine? I mean, no matter how big uh, Henry has already mentioned that we're going to have thirty uh, turbine available in the market. Uh, would you please hear your comment with us in terms of the uh, growth of the next generation of offer turbine? Thank you. Uh, do you think so in general? I think um, actually back to Henrik's presentation and and, uh, and team books here. Um, if we look at the uh, at the news sites in general, uh, what is driving the 
this case is the, the bigger turbines, the, uh, the fewer foundations, the fewer uh, the less in volume of our weak cables and so on. So the balance of the plant following the bigger, larger turbines normally gives a good business case. Of course, there are a couple of things that can, in specific cases, uh, pull our business case the other way. Uh, first of all, if a turbine type is uh, too new, uh, just introduced into the market, uh, and not mature enough, um, given the risk profile that we are looking for in that specific project. So if we don't have sort of enough evidence and validation of the turbine's performance, performance before a final investment decision, that's one part. More project-specific considerations, and that can be on more project-specific considerations, and that can be on the logistics, the supply chain, um, specific requirements on local content and other uh, parameters like that, because that can also, in some cases, uh, turn towards a specific turbine type, uh, either of, of brand or of smaller size than the newest and biggest on the market. But also one more thing driving our choice uh, very much, not just the size, but generally to introduce and uh, to keep on the high competitive level between the turbine OEMs. Because as one of Henrik's remarks as well, to drive down price over time for offshore wind power, that has been increased competition. And looking into the world market uh, volume and prediction, no matter if we're only focusing on a scenario where it's about generating electricity or if it's generating electricity and producing hydrogen and other uh, market volume will be big. And therefore, we are also pushing for having several turbine suppliers worldwide. All right. Uh, thank you, Christina. I think uh, you the point um, has been well made, uh, like you did in Copenhagen offshore. Um, I, I hear you, you. You mentioned that you know the new turbine will have the you know. Uh, bring the developer turbine OEM to think about the balance of plan and also uh, as it makes sense to have this keep the com competition going on that's one way um, to drop down the cost of energy um uh, i have one question here is that um so from Oster as the the one as the world leading uh off your wonderful developer and operator uh do you believe that um, 14 megawatt, the largest one, recently released by SGRE, that's not the end of the story. Do you believe that the turbine size will continue to grow? Uh, do you generally um, believe that the projection um, by Henrik uh, is almost in line with what how you see it um, from Oster? Thank you. Um... It is difficult to, to see it continuing to grow just kind of into the sky on Rotterdam either and uh, and nominal power. But definitely uh, we st still see a, um, a curve where we will be uh, as an industry and offshore moving on to, uh, beyond the 14 to 15 megawatts uh, and likely into the 20 megawatt range. If we we'll see another step uh, or a, a, a less Gradient on the curve from 20 megawatt is difficult still to project, uh, as especially some of the logistics will be uh, a challenge. But from the, the panel you joined uh, last winter. I mean, the turbine OEM are talking about uh, is the possibility to get, you know, the next generation turbine up to 20. But as you mentioned, we have to think about the balance of plan, the supply chain. So at the end of the day, probably the industry needs to go back to rethink about which level is the right, you know, like which size is the right size in terms of the local supply chain gets the cost optimized or get the cost under control. Do you still believe that that will be the way out? Thank you. Yeah, I think we will see a, a, a continuous uh, balancing between the, the cost of the balance of plants and turbines. 
but also looking into OLM and, and logistics as key drivers in the uh, in the business case. And then, of course, uh, again, what comes in is also the materials, new materials, inventions. Um, not that I believe something will disrupt <clears throat> completely and uh, new uh, materials will will break it, but it's, it's kind of gradually many different improvements going on at MC and into encountering for our pipeline short on a specific projects, but also the more long term uh, on, on projects in new markets and new requirements yeah. that will drive new products and, and elements of the wind power plant. Okay. Uh Thank you for coming. So, uh, uh, as you know, we have uh, two Chinese uh, developer and also one of the leading Shanghai Electric, the leading um, Chinese offshore turbine supplier on this panel. So, uh, as, as we discussed, Europe is absolutely ahead of the game, uh, has largest turbine installed, uh, uh, what we, we have uh, in China already installed. Uh, do you have any advice to the um, turbine OEM at the Chinese um, developer on this panel in terms of like if there were like the one lesson critical learned in the past regarding how to work larger turbine sites, uh, you know, the offer new models, um, do you have any good recommendation or something that you'd be aware of in terms of mistake made in the past and lesson learned? Any comment on that? Well, I think, yeah, a couple of observations, uh, kind of drawing back even to uh, smaller turbines and onshore and market introductions. And I think looking ahead for new turbine and, and into offshore and bigger turbines, I think it's really, really important to do the homework well, to make sure to have a, a understanding of the uh, of the entire lifetime of the product when this, during the design so that the uh, um, to install and to maintain is part of the uh, design requirements from the very beginning. Uh, and also to, to do the homework well in the sense of testing and validating the different technologies, part systems of the turbines, because to uh, pre a, a turbine technology and a, and a product into the market offshore is having not just for the turbine OEM, but also for the developer significant um, price uh, and loss and also uh, reputation and belief on offshore wind. So to do the homework well, ensure proper validation before going big and scaling up the volume, that is, is key, uh, as I see it, especially in these bigger and bigger turbines and, and further offshore. All right, thank you uh, so much, uh, Christina, for your uh, suggestion and recommendation to uh, our uh, panelists who join uh, us today. So now let's uh, switch uh, from uh, Europe uh, also to uh, to China. Um, now I'm going to uh, ask one question to uh, uh, Shanghai Electric. Uh, Kandong. Uh, Kandong, you can hear me clearly, right? 我叫你听什么没问题啊好的好的就是现在我叫呃请教你一下问题啊刚才呃亨瑞呃已经把目前海上风电以及未来海上大道啊进行的发展的这个路线图基本上给咱们沟可能到二零三零年那二十兆啊
as the chief digital officer of uh, your company and also the technology general manager. How do you see the big size um, uh, turbines and its R&D? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to share. I will share with you my view. 呃, 长叶片已经是一个趋势 因为只有通过技术的大型化才能降低这个成本 那么低分数上在目前来讲呢，它不一定从经济效益来讲，它不一定是呃大技术不一定这个适合市场呢。我们可以考虑呢，大容量呃长叶片的机组。所以上海电器我们逐步呢，在中国市场呢引进了我们的
in the future, we try to develop the larger turbines and we put that into the market. And more importantly, for the next generation of the intelligent control, we try to customize our products according to the requirements through the industrial application. We can lower the load and also the brakes connecting the grid, flexible power generations, and also the online diagnosis and life cycle monitoring. So in this way, we can really achieve what we have like for the offshore large turbines. All of them can be connected to the power grid. And we can meet all the flexible requirements from the customers. But actually for our next generation, first of all, we need to do the testing onshore. So for example, we have the largest production site for 1.5 GW. And we will launch our next generation smart control for the large turbine. So in the future, generally speaking, for the offshore power is the same. It takes some time to do that. Maybe in the 14th five-year plan or 15th five-year plan, we can build the large offshore production site. We hope that some onshore products can also be introduced to the offshore market. So generally speaking, that in the overall designing, we have been very innovative. We try to make them lighter, bigger blades, lighter rotors, and then plus the digitalization, the wind farm, plus all the technology. We hope that we can. So, as OEM, as the largest OEM in China, from your understanding about the offshore market, so what's your comment on this turbine? How do you comment on the competition in the market? And now there are more suppliers in the market, so how do you comment? So, Mr. Zhao, I didn't quite catch up. I didn't hear clearly. You repeat. Can you hear me? Yeah, now it's okay. Now it's fine. Can you repeat a little bit? So, for the large turbines in Chinese market, we have many suppliers of 8 megawatts, larger turbines. Christina also mentioned that in Europe, so to keep a competition in the market is very favorable. It can lower the cost. It can vitalize the market. And now in China, we have the suppliers, we have competitors in the market. So how do you see the competition in the market? Do you think it's also a good news to have a competition? And you are the largest OEM in China. So what's your comment on the competition of the market? Mr. Kong? Mr. Kong? Okay, I think now I can hear you. I have repeated my question. Did you hear me? So, Mr. Kong, we think we have some IT problem. The internet connection is very poor. So maybe we will go back to you later. And now I will give that to Miss Dong. Miss Dong, can you unmute you? Miss Dong. Miss Dong, can you hear me? Miss Dong, can you hear me? Yes, yes. So Christina? and Mr. Kang from Shanghai Electric, they talk about the large turbines. So as a developer, I know that you are in Yangjiang, which is a very frontier city of the offshore wind power. And last year, our conference was held there. So now you are in Yangjiang, you are located in Yangjiang, and you are having this 300 megawatts project. So from first point of view, for the large turbines, we know 
that in China, average size is 4.2 megawatts. And in your project, you use the 5.5 megawatts turbine. So as a developer, how do you comment on the large turbines? And also as the owner of the product, do you think the larger, the better? I want to hear your comment. Thank you very much. So Mr. Zhao and also the panelists, good afternoon. So I'm very happy to be invited for this discussion. So because of the poor signal, so some part of the Christina's presentation, I didn't catch up quite clearly. I heard part of what Mr. Zhao and Mr. Kang mentioned. As for the larger turbine, so when I first entered into this industry in 2002, at that time, the installed capacity of the wind power was about the half a million, half a million kilowatt hours. 18 years ago, only half a million kilowatt. At that time, for the onshore, we have about the 600 kilowatts and it was imported. And then we have the domestic production with the policy support, industry development. The turbines has raised from the to one megawatts, to one point five, two megawatts, three megawatts. So the turbines are getting bigger and bigger. And besides all transportation, other limitation we have, I think for the offshore wind, actually we are accelerating. We are moving faster towards the larger turbines. For our project, we take the two point five megawatts turbines. So we can say that in 2017, when our project was approved, we don't have any of the big turbines there. And then two years ago, we have the first prototype of the, now we have installed 100 turbines already. And like, I just, like you just mentioned, six megawatts, seven megawatts, we have even larger megawatts of the turbines in the market. Even for the 5.5 megawatts turbines, they are gradually replaced by the six megawatts and the even larger turbines. So undoubtedly, the turbines are getting bigger and bigger, and this is inevitable. We have estimation. So for the same cost, so the, if we use a 6.4 megawatt turbine to replace a 5.5 megawatt Turbine, the initial investment can be lower by 10 to 15 percent. But of course, as the developers or the OEM, for the owners, when we talk about the safety of the asset and the reliability, I want to make sure that the turbines can run in a very long time, safely, in the full life cycle of the turbines, whether they are stable enough. And also, I agree with what Mr. Kang mentioned. We need to use the digitalization, module production. In this way, we can make sure that our operation can be convenient. Maintenance can also be very convenient, so we can lower the cost. And for this industry, I have to say that for any of the products, So I just want to echo back to what Mr. Kang mentioned. In OEM, when we do our future roadmap, when we plan for the future, we need to have a forward-looking view. And if we do that, the r and cost will be really high, and that cost will definitely be reflected in the project, and finally will be uh, covered by the customers. And another point is, as long as this model is confirmed, we hope that um, there will be an opportunity for it to grow more mature, and the investment like uh, the transition chain and we hope that we develop and pandemic this year. Thank you, Michelle. So, 
this town and in this dome. So also then this a constructor and uh, this year for each investors for the ROI we pay great attention to it and this year a lot of uh, investors are trying to competing for it. and uh, those are also because of uh, the ROI issue. Maybe it is not in line with the requirement of their companies. And that's one of the main reason. As for the future development, if we cannot hit the target or if the cost can uh, realize the low um, cost uh, grid connection or uh, the investors are not going to, to be very interested. And the third point is that, as uh, Ms. Dong has mentioned well already, um, for the large power turbines, uh, for the feasibility of it, how big it is, as we've mentioned already, uh, especially like the construction uh, equipment, whether there is limitation. And uh, from this year and next year, uh, there will be a lot of uh, competition to build them as soon as possible. And basically, uh, we can see uh, that uh, the situation is very intense. A lot of uh, companies and a lot of, uh, when they make the um, supply, and sometimes it cannot meet the requirement of uh, the launching of uh, operation next year. So some of the companies just give up. And for our company, uh, we have given up a lot of uh, project, uh, projects already because maybe we cannot meet the requirement uh, to complete next year. But for the large power turbines, uh, and it's already more than 200 meters, 250, 260 already. So from this perspective, in China, now we only have uh, one um, ship to uh, help the construction of such big turbines. If uh, uh, it develops, but the equipment cannot meet the requirement of uh, the uh, construction um, requirements of uh, the large turbines, the investors are going to do a lot of uh, comparison. If uh, the investment requirement cannot be met or the investment time will be delayed, then the return investment will be slower. And that is also one of the main considerations. And uh, with uh, fewer ships, the investment cost will be higher. And uh, for the uh, low cost uh, grid connection, the challenge will be bigger. And uh, maybe some of the costs can be reduced, but if uh, the construction cost is increased or the technology to offset the increase of a construction cost. I believe that for the investors in terms of uh, the investment, they will also going to do a lot of considerations. And also for the investors, uh, 
uh, for our company on this platform with the construction we did a lot of uh, uh, in action if the foundations are not uh, well tested uh, in the long period of time the reliability of uh, the project cannot be maintained and also in the maintenance and test if the reliability of the turbine is not big enough then uh, that will be a very tough issue for us so the construction equipment are very limited and if the uh, reliability is also low, then the cost of maintenance of and check will be also increased. And we believe that the loss of electricity will also be higher. For example, for 10 days or 30 days uh, for the maintenance, if it is 10 to 15 megawatt, uh, maybe three terabytes, in 10 days and 15 days, the investors are going to think about the investment very well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Zhang. From the perspective of investors and construction and constructors to think about it because you're a large company. I think very clear already, the trend is definitely there, but we have to put our feet on the ground to think about the development. Uh, if it is you're going too fast, the construction equipment cannot follow, then the cost of state may not be uh, investment. And also, uh, we've mentioned already, uh, Christina also asked, in the European summit, a lot of CTOs did a lot of in, uh, discussion and the developers have uh, said, well, and we welcome the big ones, but uh, the reliability is also very important. And you've mentioned already, if there's a problem now, the largest one is 14 megawatt. And if there's a, in the future, there's a problem that will be very big impact. Once again, I'd like to thank Mr. Zhang for your comment. And about uh, the big uh, power uh, turbines, we're going to stop here. And uh, we have uh, the largest uh, developer uh, from China, uh, Shanghai Electric and uh, Mr. Zhao. From the perspective of uh, uh, developers, do not have installation yet. And uh, we will talk about the situation in overseas first. First of all, I'd like to confirm with Christina. Christina. Speak another language. Uh, um, now let's uh, continue uh, to the next topic. That's the floating. Regarding floating, as you know well, um, right now I mentioned you know in China we don't uh, in Asia Pacific we only have floating in Japan uh, at this moment. Um, but in China, the Chinese order we don't have. But in Europe, uh, we, we we do have some you know uh, demonstration project going on. Um, earlier. This kind of 8.4 uh, floating turbine installed um, in um, Portugal. Uh, now we have uh, more turbine OEMs, uh, developer engaged in you know uh, this sector, like Equino, uh, Shell, most recently Toto. Uh, they all are looking at the floating, uh, looking at the, the the pipeline project pipeline uh, at Oster. I can see. Uh, there is no floating project under construction or in a pipeline. Uh, I'd like to know, you know, based on uh, what has been going on here, you know, a lot of the, 
in you know uh, input uh, in this sector, uh, big developer and oil gas company, uh, turbine OEM, they are passionate about the floating. Henrik uh, himself also have uh, you know the floating design uh, under his technology company. Um, so as a, the lead offshore wind farm developer. Would you please share your view regarding the floating, you know, trend in terms of technology, uh, in terms of market growth um, in Europe and globally, and how do you see this uh, uh, business sector growing? Thank you. For sure. Uh, I agree very much with looking ahead that uh, where the offshore wind industry has really started has been in, in Europe, Northwestern Europe, in the shallow waters. And this is also where formerly done, then later on, after started uh, transferring from uh, from our uh, old business of oil and gas and into uh, offshore wind power, and thereby in the relatively shallow waters. And when we are now expanding uh, outside of Northwestern Europe into new markets in Asia, also on the east coast of US, uh, our present um, pipeline is still projects to be constructed is still in these kind of old waters. Or for the time being, we are not planning specific projects using floating uh, structures as a technology, but definitely uh, when looking ahead beyond our present portfolio of projects that we're going to construct onto around 25, 26, where it's kind of uh, the end of our pipeline that we know of, uh, there's no doubt that we will also be looking into uh, two sites where flo floating makes a lot of sense. And I also agree very much to Henrik's long-term projections when we're looking at the, uh, the globe where we have the high uh, concentration of people near to shore. It is not often where it's shallow water, uh, but relatively deep waters. So I see a market expansion uh, a globe, around the globe for offshore wind power where it will be combinations of uh, bottom fixed structures and floating structures and probably many different sorts of technologies because that's the normal question I'm being getting. So what type of floating technology? I think there will be several types. And we see different types of foundations with strengths and weaknesses, just depending on where it is, what turbine type it is, what soil condition is this, local content requirements, availability of materials, and a lot of other factors. So uh, I do definitely do see that we will have uh, floating and bottom fixed as long as I can see in the offshore wind market. Okay, thank you for your comment, uh, Christina. So uh, I think uh, you made it clear uh, there will be a future floating. Um, but looking at the challenge, I think um, in Copenhagen offshore and the turbine OEM, also uh, utility, including you, I think um, you all mentioned uh, in terms of floating, the, the, the biggest challenge here, that's many the, you know, we have so many uh, different option technology uh, in the marketplace. And just, do you still believe that the, the challenge for floating right now is many, uh, you know, uh, so crowd market, and that's not really helpful in terms of how to bring down the cost for the floater. Is that still the case? Uh, yes, unfortunately, I think that's still the case that we are looking into for some years and, and maybe for quite a long period, that there is not uh, one concept that we see as the optimum uh, regarding all the different design driving parameters. And therefore, it will be difficult to see how one concept will have very massive uh, scale uh, and therefore cost reductions as part of the industrialization. But I think one of the parameters when floating is taking off is this availability of, of material and uh, a proper infrastructure for the supply chain. Uh, that's for sure the uh, modularity and transportability of the floaters um, at, at the, near to the key sites. Uh, and then of course the input potential for taking out further costs through uh, material optimization and general optimization when seeing the first are working and then uh, getting wiser about the design and how it's behaving. Because I think when looking ahead, we do see a, a lot of very, very innovative concepts 
uh, and also coming from companies that have very little uh, experience about offshore um, work and offshore wind power in particular. So we will see that some of the concept will basically be dying before they get to uh, to projects. Uh, and that is part of the consolidation that we are, we are just monitoring for the time being. And of course, keeping our view open on the different concepts. I hear you. So you mentioned, uh, I'm glad to hear that you mentioned consolidation. I think um, from from GWAT propon uh, you know, point of view, I think uh, followed like this uh, turbine OEM market, we, we, we have been saying the consolidation going on for, for along the years. Uh, 2015, we have nearly 60 turbine OEM today in 2019 in terms of new data, loading 33, you know, still active in the market. I think for the float uh, floater in terms of floating design, foundation design, um, you already mentioned that some of them probably cannot survive before it's getting mature uh, technically. But do you see the uh, consolidation? Let's see, we already saw uh, we have already seen, you know, Shell company. Um, so is there any like appetite from Oster? Do you believe that maybe you will follow the same strategy? I mean, uh, looking at the uh, strategy or uh, business plan, we can see Oster has been expanding, especially after make commitment will be completely carbon neutral and be a truly renewable company. And you expand it uh, in United States onshore and solar uh, PV as well. And you are the leading offshore uh, operator. So look, floater, uh, floating when you already confirm it's a future. So is there any, anything under your radar? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's actually uh, a good question, very good question, because we have very many different opportunities that we have set beyond offshore wind, back kind of back into onshore wind and PV, uh, working on several renewables right now, of course, looking very much and also active now on hydrogen as a as part of power to X. Hence discussions about what should we spend our capital on? How should we invest? Should we, as some of our competitors, buy into the supply chain or should we basically uh, um, be an EPC contractor and buy from the best manufacturers of the different uh, elements of wind power or uh, power plants in general, uh, renewable power plants. And right now that is our strategy. So we're not having any plans to um, to start buying up uh, a potential um, floating um, developer uh, as we are right now. We will be, uh, will be buying floating concepts as we are buying turbines from different uh, other companies that are experts in what they do. And when we, our expertise is basically to put all the elements together into a wind power plant uh, based on the supply chain uh, available at that time. Okay, I hear you. I think that's uh, that's louder and clear. Thank you so much um, for making a comment regarding uh, this is a strategic question. Thank you. Now let's uh, move on um, to China. Uh, as I said, uh, in China, we don't have a uh, floating offshore, but uh, I'm aware of that company, including Shanghai Electric, is working on some pilot project, demonstration project uh, near Shanghai or somewhere in China. So, Kanzo, now this question will come back to you. So, Mr. Kang, I know that you are the largest OEM. So floating foundation is one of the future trends of the deep water. So currently, on the technology side, in Shanghai Electric, what is your plan of floating foundation? And what do you see about the future of the floating technology in China? Thank you very much. I want to use this opportunity to share with you some of our technology. So currently, just like Henrik mentioned, in China, I know that for the floating foundation, Europe is quite leading. They have been doing that for years. And in China, I think for the floating foundation, for the large commercialization, we still need some years to go. It takes a long time to do that. We expect that in 
the 15 five year plan, we can reach the scale production. So, in the 14th five year plan, so I don't think it will be possible. We still need to explore all the technology supply chain. So, for the floating foundation and floating technology, no matter in Europe or in China, to the deep water and the far shore, they account for 80 percent of the wind resources we have. Just like Harry mentioned, in the deep water and far shore, that if all these resources can supply our power grid. It can fully meet our requirements of the industry. So on the technical side, I shall market is mature enough. On the technical side, we need to accelerate our R and D and development. We need to prepare for the market to be mature in the future. And secondly, what we are good at in the floating foundation. I think Henrik mentioned anomaly because currently we are having this anomaly market. Because in Europe, you know that for the deep water, about 20 kilometers away from the shore, it can be more than 70 meters deep. But in China, because of the geological condition, that within the 100 kilometers from the shore, we only have about 30 meters to 60 meters depth of the water. You know that for the floating foundation, Normally, we need the water depth to be more than 50 meters to make it tangible. And then it is viable and it's valid for the floating population. And even at 100 kilometers away from the shore, it's still very shallow. So in the future, if we want to develop our floating foundation, in such a shallow water of 30 meters to 50 meters, whether we shall use a fixed foundation or floating foundation, we have a different opinion on that. But of course, a lot of OEM, a lot of the project owners, they want to use the fixed foundation. But for the shallow water between 30 to 50 meters, the floating foundation is also tangible, and also it can be cheaper. So in the future, I think this is what we have in China. We just have a lot of shallow water. So we couldn't fully copy uh, floating technology from Europe or United States. We need to develop the floating foundation, which can be adapted to the shallow water of China. And based on that, we can deploy our wind turbines. So on the technical side, we are trying to explore the floating foundation within 30 meters to 50 meters water depth. And in the long run, I shall say that floating foundation is much complex. It's very complicated, it's very challenging in technology. It needs the whole supply chain of the industry. It can, shall also meet the unique feature of the shallow water in China. At the same time, it shall also be localized to produce. So that's why I think that for the technical innovation, that is a challenge we have. Uh, for a few minutes. So that's why we need to develop the floating technology that can be adapted to China. This is a technical issue, and so far the technology is not ready yet. And for Shanghai Electric, this is what we are doing. We try to break the glass ceiling there, and this kind of technology has been under development. And just like the large turbines we mentioned, we also need to accelerate to speed up our market value through all the different technologies by introducing the European technology to China and be innovative ourselves to find our local suppliers as well as the geological conditions. We try to develop or customize the floating foundation. Another condition for China is that for most of the deep water and far shore, they are in the monsoon area. 
So in terms of a challenge, the Chinese development in terms of economy and also the adaptation to the wind and the typhoons, uh, we're having better performance than the Europe in this regard. And those can be resolved by the technology. And we know the floating is a large systematic technology. We need the base, we need uh, some uh, dynamic cable uh, technology and uh, the recognizes uh, technology and we need a lot of efforts from, from the whole industry and we need the support um, uh, some uh, government support of technology uh, projects around those technologies mentioned so for our company I'm afraid we lost him there's no sound Only when all those problems are addressed can we really come to the commercialization. And this tough point is that we need to make sure that those owners can get more than 8% of ROI. And how can we make sure the integrated development, the design base, the turbine base, and also the energy transmission, and even hydrogen can and also all those technologies need to be uh, valid. So we believe that in the future, during the 14th five-year plan, we still need to do make more technology breakthroughs. And as we mentioned, we need to learn from the Europe experience at the first point, and also in line with uh, the local technology feature, especially the geo situation to map the suitable floating turbine and also the system technology that will be the key point in the future. That's for me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kang. In light of time, as, uh, in terms of uh, floating, we do not hurry up a little bit because we uh, have a little bit delay. We only have 10 minutes left. So we're going to turn over to the next topic. Um, I apologize, Mr. James Dome. And uh, we have other important uh, topics that we need your sharing of experience. Rapidly, we come to the next topic about the power to ads. Christina? Hello. Hello, Christina? can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, so, I can hear you. Yeah. Quick. So, you know, uh, we are running a little bit late. So therefore, we quickly uh, move on to the next topic that's regarding uh, what you already mentioned in terms of power to X. I think power to X, that's a big part um, presented by Henry Sister this morning. I think that's, the, that's how the, the future looks like. Uh, looking at the power to X solution, Oster is taking the leading role in this uh, aspect. And uh, we are aware of that you have um, a hydrogen project uh, uh, going on uh, in the UK. And also most recently uh, in Denmark, uh, Oster signed a partnership with the leading shipping like Copenhagen airport uh, Scandinavia, SAS, Scandinavia Airline, and DE, um, DFDS, and also DSV, this large logistic company. And the goal is clear. Uh, you try to work in, you know, with the partner, but there is all fuel one. So uh, we can use hydrogen to power, you know, uh, the land road transportation, bus, trucks, heavy trucks, et cetera. And also looking at the solution like renewable methyl or ammonia for, uh, for the shipping industry, like the vessels. And also together with uh, your partner, like Copenhagen Airport, looking for the potential for the jet fuel. That's what the Henrik is working on as well. So uh, it's a really fascinating vision uh, in terms of the future uh, looking. Um, but as the, a leading supplier, uh, actually, you are not just to present the you know future. Actually, also has already working on the initiative. So it would be very much uh, 
interesting to hear your comment regarding as a leading of your wonderful developer, how do you see the future? How do you see the big opportunity by working across the industry? Thank you. I see a, a very, very, very large potential when looking ahead because um, in general, all these different subparts of power to X, uh, kind of no matter the, the size and the shape of X, they do, they do exist. Uh, they are they are technologies of today. They can work. Uh, this is very much about combining them, putting them into a system design, and then uh, decreasing the uh, the the cost of uh, transferring uh, energy from electricity to whatever new uh, medium and for for the different applications. I think that journey is just starting right now. It's more or less like zooming back 20, uh, 30 years ago when uh, wind power really was in its, uh, in its cradle and looking ahead and saying it has a big potential, but does it work and can we make it work and can we make it cheap enough? And this is about the same beginning of a new era that I'm looking in front of here with power to X, where we do know for sure that the source of electricity from especially offshore wind power is huge. We've brought the cost down dramatically, the same on onshore wind power. Now it's just a matter of then transferring all this energy to new vessel fuels versus other applications. It's still not something that we are too concerned about, honestly. Uh, that doesn't matter that much. Right now, it's a matter of combining all these technologies and uh, making them perform, making sure that it can work as a system, that it can be controlled, that can be intelligent versus the different needs at different times, safe, of course, as well, uh, and getting then the cost down, making sure that we can use this as building blocks similar to the smaller scale of a wind power plant. This is an add-on. This is kind of looking into the future where we need uh, to have energy from, uh, from electricity to many, many other applications onshore. So to me, this is a, uh, it is really a transformation that we are standing in front of and not just in the usual markets uh, close to wind energy, but where we can also make a, a leap uh, on geography because we can then transport some of these fuels in other ways than the uh, electrical grid system. So, so to me, this looks extremely challenging and very, very, very possible for all of us. Thank you, Christina. I think uh, I like uh, the, um, the concept you mentioned it's all about the combination. You know, we have those independent, uh, those technology independently existing. Now, looking at the global energy transition, I think um, you made it clear. Make it as a system. I think uh, what we're missing right now, uh, looking at the wind industry alone, it's time to think about the system collaboration and the uh, system LCOE uh, thinking, etc. So, thank you for your comment. I'm, I'm, I'm. Pretty sure that what the Oster is doing right now, I mean, in Europe, as the leading offshore uh, wind farm developer, it's absolutely inspiring for not just for speaker um, join us from China and also for you know uh, leading utility IPP. Uh, Think, think about the same. I think if all the stakeholders from different industries think about the same way like you do regarding the system approach, I think we are not going, we are not going to, to say that's impossible to achieve. That's absolutely a bright future waiting for us. Uh, thank you for coming to the hydrogen. Now let's uh, Let's come back to China. Ms. Dong? Ms. Dong, can you hear me? Okay. Just now we've mentioned the hydrogen. And uh, in Europe, uh, OSLED has been participating into a lot of uh, projects from the onshore and aviation and shipping, etc. They had some demonstration project at the early stage. And uh, I believe that for your company, you've been engaged into like a 863 R and D projects. Uh, 
comment about uh, where we are in China in terms of uh, the power to hydrogen. Okay, thank you, Mr. Zhao. As I have uh, been participating into the A63 project, so I can give you some uh, brief introduction. We know that uh, the uh, hydrogen is this actually an in integration of uh, different industries. It's kind of a green hydrogen. So there's a very high social recognition, but a very high cost. But a 4F company, we're one of the early starters to do the research on the power to hydrogen. And uh, in the A63 project, I believe that so we did some um, technology exploration. We have a very good team now to have a continuous development. And also we followed the uh, combination with the renewables. The key point is that how can we use the renewables, the uh, electrolyzed water to produce hydrogen and also enter different uh, made a lot of uh, development research on the refilling stations of hydrogen. So I'd like to share with you some of my rough understanding on this topic. When we started to do this project, uh, we had a certain background uh, in history. To a large extent, we tried to address the, the issue of um, the limitation of electricity and uh, curtailment of wind. Uh, actually, um, in 2010, we started to have a lot of a curtailment. In 2016, about uh, 49.3 billion kilowatt hours of a curtailment. In some countries, uh, some provinces, even 30% in Gansu province, even 43% of uh, curtailment under this background in order to expand the uh, supplementary of uh, wind and hydrogen. We took the lead together with the five research institutions to uh, lead this uh, project in 2018 we got the uh, reception from the MOST administration hours are more than 1000 hours and uh, for this uh, wind power coupling technology we use the curtailment to turn the water uh, into the hydrogen and uh, store them when there is uh, uh, no load, there is a fluctuation of the wind power. So uh, we use the stored hydrogen and maybe we use uh, the battery to turn them into electricity and uh, connect them to the grid so that we can use the curtailment uh, to optimize the uh, electric power pick. And of course, we can use uh, pipelines and also the tux to turn them into, uh, to transport them to different application terminals. But that was so the demonstration project and um, the for the battery uh, fuel batteries uh, 30 uh, kilowatt so with the research we discovered that for these to 40 percent of a curtailment they can do further research but mostly i think we need to uh, open our mind as uh, we mentioned already, for the Chinese uh, hydrogen development, uh, wind to hydrogen development, I think Christina shared with us very good points already. Uh, I think if this is one direction for power to act, but uh, for the developers like us, I hope that the power can be m more widely applied. The hydrogen production is one market for us. And in China, we started uh, a little bit late, but then for the development of hydrogen from 2016 to 20. Uh, uh, 2004 to 2016, we uh, like in 2016, we have the roadmap. Um, maybe you're familiar with uh, the 12 green hydrogen projects. One of them were introduced by me already. And um, one of the largest one is uh, for in Hebei province, and they have a collaboration with uh, Germany. Uh, there is a demonstration project. And uh, by last year in March, Last year, we have launched the hydrogen design policies. There are nine items of them. 30 cities in China have launched the related hydrogen plan roadmaps. And ever since the second half of last year, there are some uh, uh, projects that draw great attention, like uh, in Jinning, they have uh, the uh, Hydrogen Valley in the north part of China, and in Guangdong, they have uh, the Hydrogen Challenge, and also we have um, the hydrogen battery uh, powered uh, vehicles, etc. There are a lot of applications. It is fair to say that China is now making efforts toward this direction. 
，首先要看它的方向对不对啊，它是不是跟我们人类发展的这种历程是吻合的？那发展氢能呢，它是能源转型的一种技术路线，而氢气呢？形成非常强的一个竞争力。呃，印发了二零二零年的能源工作指导意见通知里面，就两次提到了氢能产业的发展方向，这就给出了一个非常积极的信号。而刚才回过头来说，我们在研发的就是做这个八六三课题的时候，是针对气风限电。那二零一七年以来呢，呃，其实这个状况已经得到很大程度的缓解。到去年呢。Of this whole industry, and according to the hydrogen report, the renewable energy to generate the hydrogen. You know, we have a different kinds of the hydrogen there, like Christine, for the wind. At the very beginning, we win competing with the coal-based power. It was very weak. So only for the technical advancement, lowering the cost, you can be competitive in the market. It's the same that for the hydrogen, compared of the green hydrogen to the blue hydrogen and other, the market potential is limited. But if you look at the onshore, Power, wind power is much cheaper for the onshore than the offshore. So, if we want to have the offshore technology in the future, we need to consider the application and lowering the cost of that. So, currently in China, the offshore wind to produce the hydrogen, we are still in the very preliminary idea of that. But in the future, when the offshore wind gets to the more deeper water, no matter about the The development, the flexible, all its foundations for the future, and besides what I mentioned about the hydrogen applications, I think we can also consider to have some brainstorm. For example, in the future, if we can solve the problem of the sea water desalination, the technical solution. Including the storage and transportation of hydrogen, because we cannot transport the fresh water to the sea, because we have so much sea water. Definitely, we need to do the desalination of the sea water. And for the power product, no matter it's onshore or offshore, the best way is to consume the power locally. So one of the solutions we have is onshore. Power is that to have the long distance transmission, and now for the offshore wind, we can deliver the power to the 70 kilometers, 80 meter kilometers away. But they rely on the oil and gas pipeline to deliver the hydrogen. So after the hydrogen is produced for the offshore, so for the hydrogen, less than 10 percent, we put that in. The natural gas pipeline to the onshore. Actually, they have saved a lot of money from the infrastructure. So we also need to consider whether we have this infrastructure or not. I also quite agree with the energy island concept. So ideally, one day in the future, if we generate the hydrogen offshore. Based on the wind farm, if we can have the hydrogen station to add the hydrogen to the pipeline, so we can have add the hydrogen to the boat, cruise, and to provide the energy to the user for the boat, take the solid or liquid hydrogen into storage and take them back to the shore. Then I think that definitely we can expand. The activities of human beings. So that's the idea we have. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I 
think the second half of you have the imagination. This week, actually, the Denmark government has already approved the concept of the two energy islands. One is in the North Sea, another one is the Baltic Sea. So these two energy islands, about 5 GW offshore wind has already been improved. So all that will also be part of this project. So definitely in the future, what you mentioned will be become true in 2030. In Shanghai Electric. So when we talk about the offshore wind, it's not only about that. We have the floating foundation, hydrogen production, hydrogen fuel, uh, fuel cell, the offshore transportation, aviation, oil. So there are many sectors. I know you are very busy. You need to read them. So for Shanghai Electric, from domestic and international trends, in the power to X, what will be your focus? Can you briefly talk about that? What will be your focus for the power to X? As for Shanghai Electric, we haven't formally participated in the production of the hydrogen. We still focus on providing some reliable energy. So currently, in China, we have already done some demo studies. The first hydrogen project. We supply the safe, reliable energy plus energy source. <laughs> Oh. 
So I don't know to know that we mentioned the view and with such a lot of the pressure. Sorry, there are a lot of noise. Um, this year, in our United States company, we have been faced with each of those companies. The government has issued the guidance of the national fifth standard. The smooth back of the week as the master. We want to take more technologies. We also hope that the after the wind farm is invested, we can have the profitable potential. Another one is that we want to have the scale production and the lower the cost of all different size investors, owners, and builders. So we want, we don't want to have malicious competition and we want to work together in certain sectors to develop and lower the cost. So our wind farm can be competitive in the power price. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for talking about this future of the industries and also from the operator side. So going back to Ms. Dong, so with such a lot of pressure, so how do you communicate with your owners on the technical side? How can you lower the cost of that? So can you give us some recommendation? There are a lot of noise in the background. Because for our project, we have a sensitivity analysis. The most important thing is to lower the cost and to increase the efficiency. So we have a, such a long coastal lines. Then we have the typhoons. We also have the cold seasons. So first of all, we need to understand that we need to have a very good survey about that. And also another one is about the standard. So for example, that in the electrical side and also on the C side, we can further explain that. And also for the hydrogen industry as a very dangerous gas, so whether that will be connected to our offshore wind standard in the future, I think this is the basis for the future. Another one is about the wind turbines, the full supply chain support, we need to do that. Another one is on the operation, that is to lower the cost. As for the efficiencies, definitely I want to talk about the adaptability research. So it shall meet about the wind farm. So actually that for each of the wind turbines, we need to match that with our wind resources. Another one is that we need to use the large big data to improve the digitalizations through the real time monitorings. And also that all the technologies, we can make sure that we can reduce that to the operations. And in this way, we can improve our overall efficiencies and also the transmissions. So in this way, I think that it will be more tangible for us. Mr. Zhao, thank you very much.
So we believe that uh, if uh, the subsidy went to, goes away, the, the industry should also develop. And I mean, in Shandong and Shanghai, you also have a lot of deployment of the industries for the future development. I believe that those are very important directions. Can you briefly help us to uh, like use one minute uh, to, from the perspective of technology, share with us a little bit? Hello, thank you. And uh, we did some estimation. And by the end of uh, 14th five-year plan, uh, for our company, we can uh, realize uh, the affordable price, uh, great connection. So in the five years, we're going to make a, a lot of effort in order to realize the flat rate. Uh, we believe that this is a great challenge for the industry. So for the OEMs and for the turbine, we need to reduce 35%. And for the base, um, under the current cost level, we need to have a 20% of uh, um, re investment reduced. And for the electrical part, uh, at least 30%. And uh, in terms of uh, O&M, 20% of uh, reduction. And for the other part, um, more than 10% of reduction. So as the OEM, uh, we in the future five years, we hope that the wind turbines on the basis of a current technology, we can have another 35% of reduction in order to have uh, the affordable price, uh, the flat rate. And uh, in terms of technology, first of all, we need to have uh, the model-based um, development, like the light uh, carbon fiber um, power generator. And uh, also we try to reduce the weight. And uh, we did a lot of exploration of uh, semi um, direct drive and uh, the quasi direct drive technologies, etc. As Ms. Joe mentioned, uh, digitalization and intelligent development are necessary. We're doing some development on the uh, digital smart turbine to realize uh, the uh, flat rate and also the demand in the future. Of course, as I've mentioned, in order to have the flat rate, the there should be 30% of reduction for the OEMs, so as the other industries. So we need the effort of the whole industry and also we need the government policy support uh, to support like for another five years to help the industry to grow mature. Thank you. I'm sorry, we lost him. I'm sorry, the moderator is muted. I'm sorry, you're muted. Uh, RMD at Oslo Offshore. Do you have any secret to share with us, with our audience here and panelists? So what's the secret for Oslo? I mean, from the technology development point of view, from the innovation perspective, what's the drivers and what's the secret which will make you so confident to believe that you can help to achieve, uh, help the industry to achieve the subsidiary fray, which will be excellent in the Take away for the Chinese audience. Thank you. 
Oh, let me see how much secrets I can share. Um, but there's definitely no doubt that our first bit uh, without any support schemes in Germany, that's a combination of many, many factors. Uh, first of all, it is also at that time when we were bidding a belief on the uh, development of the technology from at that time until when we are going to realize the project. And that goes both on the turbines as well as the foundations the entire balance of plants, uh, technology development and cost development. And then also our projection about how would the revenue stream be of those projects in the uh, expected lifetime. Uh, of course, that is a very, very high uncertainty and very difficult to predict how will the power price uh, or the energy price in Germany develop over time from the time when we are finished the construction and until the decommissioning time. And that is actually one of the bigger factors. So nothing to do with technology or what we're providing as such, but that's also part of the, of the secret why we were confident to bid uh, to zero subsidy at those projects. And then thirdly, apart from the technology and cost development of the technology and the uh, power price over time, that's actually the, the sites themselves uh, with the locations on relatively shallow water and also very good wind speeds. It's very windy sites. Remember the fuel of our power plants in offshore wind power, that is the wind. Uh, looking at the, um, at the information about wind, uh, average wind speed directions and so on, that was the uh, third major component that made us so comfortable that we were bidding without any subsidies. So uh, those are the, the magic secrets into a, a wind power plant to make it fly without any subsidy in, in the years to come in Europe. I'm afraid we'll, uh, the MCs are muted. Uh, sorry, uh, I was on mute. I mentioned uh, we are aware of that also also uh, participate the 700 megawatt uh, subsidiary zero auction in the in, in uh, Holland. Um, I think in general that's that's a trend no matter looking at Europe or China. I think there is a big pressures in terms of you know moving the industry along without the government support. Uh, I think in general uh, I have to say uh, even though we have some um, technical issue at the beginning due to the um, quality of the internet connection. But I really, really appreciate uh, all the effort staff from Henrik gave us really, I mean, the high level vision about, the, you know, offshore technology and the power to X, uh, the big map in terms of global energy transition, how to level different technology to moving forward and then joined by excellent speaker, uh, from from street speaker from China and also Christina from from Denmark also, and really really appreciate your excellent comment. Um, I think um, as the uh, chain um, the speaker Christina mentioned from we are going to have the uh, you know the physical event at the end of August. For those who doesn't feel you know enough, you are welcome to join us uh, in Shandong. I don't know what where the location. But definitely, uh, you will be um, allowed very soon. Uh, once again, thank you so much for everyone's input and uh, for your time, for your 